All right. Um, it's now 9.02. So I think uh, it's, it's a good time to start. I just wanted to check with, with our speakers. Are we, I hope everybody's uh, online and, and ready to, to start our event as much as I am. Great. Okay. I had no violent reaction, so I'm going to kick it off. Um, hi, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome, first of all, to our speakers and our participants to today's virtual town hall discussion entitled Building Digital Infrastructure for Digital Philippines. My name is Paco Pangalangan. I'm the executive director of the organizers of this event, Stratface ADR Institute, and I'll be your host and moderator for today. First of all, uh, you know, I'd like to thank uh, everybody here for sharing their mornings with us. And like you, I look forward to an interesting discussion today on the need for digital infrastructure and connective technology for digital Philippines. Now to give, uh, now to give our welcome remarks for this morning's event and to, to really kick it off, please allow me to introduce the president of Stratbase ADR Institute, Professor Dean Dumanhit for, for his opening remarks. Professor Manhit. Paco, good morning. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Uh, who are participating. Also, good morning, especially to our speakers, both in the public, the private sector, and even in the civil society uh, sector. This is really our goal in Stratbase ADR Institute, which is to bring different groups together, have a discussion, and maybe we can really move forward, especially with this topic, building digital infrastructure for digital Philippines. When the pandemic uh, exactly maybe a year ago uh, was uh, declared by the WHO, I think that was March uh, 11, we started tracking under our research and intelligence group, this risk areas. And we have always said that we need to live with the COVID-19 virus. We need to identify this risk. And maybe it's an opportunity for society, Philippine society as a whole to, to build and evolve from what is being challenged, the challenges brought by this pandemic. And what I've noticed uh, as we entered that 2021, coming across uh, the study by We Are Social, when you look at different reasons why Filipinos uh, use the internet, and it seems as how important it is, especially in a situation where we have been for nearly a year. And it's also reflective of the powerful tool of mobile, internet, and social media use in the Philippines. When we look at this data, with 110 million people, you see 152 million having mobile connection, 73.91 million, or at least 67% of our population are internet users. And more than the internet are active social media users, 89 million people. And the time that they spend on these devices, time they spend uh, on social media or on the internet, it speaks really of how important the digital, digital technology, and of course with digital technology, digital infrastructure in our daily lives. Then you've seen since last year the rise of e-commerce activity in our country. How I think it's become part of our daily life, part of some saying stay safe, staying at home, but we saw the rise of e-commerce. And with this rise of e-commerce, it's also an opportunity not only for platforms, but even for what some would say MSMEs to grow in this type of environment. But the great challenge among all this is the so-called internet connection speed. Where are we in this terms of internet connection speed? But of course, we see some improvements. 
I came across uh, this UCLA reported study of January 2021 that states that the Philippines continues to improve its overall internet speed. True, it's now at the 86th spot from 111 on the mobile internet speed while maintaining its 100th spot in fixed broadband speed when compared to a year on year on data. But we see also Philippine telcos reporting that a 500% increase in data usage when lockdown started last year. So taking this in mind, I, I tried to research more then. The researcher in me came across this uh, IMD study or the World Competitiveness Report that in terms of investment in telecommunications, the Philippines placed 10th in terms of investment in telecommunications. And of course, we all know that investments has been led by private telecommunications companies. And this is where we have built the core of what we advocate in strap-based ADR Institute. The idea of government with the private sector working together to address societal needs concerns and challenges. And when you look at this thing from a comparative study, it's really, there's this big challenge, no? again, coming from the same data that the Philippine government should invest in building digital infrastructure alongside the private sector to cope with increasing demand for connectivity. Having adequate and robust digital infrastructure is crucial to our economic recovery and will have long-term benefits that will drive sustainable growth post-COVID. That's why I've always argued in some of my commentaries that digitization is crucial for economic recovery. It has proven to be vital to economic continuity. It has enabled us to safely live and work in pandemic conditions. We need to build that robust broadband backbone, being a long-term infrastructure asset that will boost the country's competitiveness in an emerging digital economy. Indispensable in rebounding and pushing this acceptable pace of recovery. Very important. That's why here in our institute, we welcome the Telco Tower Watch idea the launch of a multi-sectoral initiative to help push the fast development of digital infrastructure in the Philippines that will promote the transparency and accountability of all relevant parties in accelerating the building pace of telecommunication towers nationwide. We laud the leadership of Secretary Rigori Honasan for taking this big step. And we are hoping that with one of our partner civil society group, Citizen Watch, we can really create this environment of transparency and accountability. Because at the end of the day, who benefits? The Filipino people and government, and I believe the private sector, we all exist for the Filipino people that we serve, for the consumers that are our customers in our private companies. Yesterday, I came out with this commentary just on the eve of this uh, uh, webinar or virtual roundtable. And I'd like to quote it just to end my, my remarks. One thing that this pandemic has taught us is the importance of the whole of society approach. I've always argued, taught this for the past 30 years when I was handling governance courses in the university, where, where I always see government, private sector, civil societies, we can address our most pressing challenges. Given the increased importance of connective technology during this pandemic, the continued development of our country's digital infrastructure is one such of the key challenges that requires the combined efforts of multiple sectors of society. Again, Welcome and thank you for joining us in this building 
a digital infrastructure for a digital Philippines vertical round. Thank you. Hi. Yes, thank you, Professor Mahir, for, for laying the foundation for today's discussion. Uh, thank you, Pastor. With that, yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, with that, Bo, I, I would like to, right before I introduce our next speaker, uh, I would like, you know, on behalf of the Institute and, and our partners, the Italian Chamber of Commerce in the Philippines, to invite the participants to use the Q&A function that you can find here on, on Zoom to, to ask our speakers some questions and we'll get to them later on in the, in the event. With that, I'd like to introduce our, our first speaker today. Uh, our first speaker is Yusek Emanuel Kaintik. He's an Undersecretary for Digital Philippines at the Department of, of ICT. He's a, a senior IT leader with uh, over two decades of experience in application design, software architecture, implementation for various enterprises. As I said, uh, is the Undersecretary for Digital Philippines of the DICT. Uh, and we look forward to hearing some of the initiatives, sir, of the DICT this morning. Uh, so, so please, uh, you say, I think you have the floor. I'd like to share some of my slides. Is that okay? Of course, well, yeah. <laughs> Can you see my screen? Is it already there? Yes. Okay. Um, to my colleagues from the government um, here in this meeting, uh, to Mr. Paco Pangalagan, to Professor Dindo Manhit, uh, to our friends in the telecommunications industry, uh, Mr. Vince Tempoco, Vice President of Site Acquisition from Globe, to Attorney Roy Ibai, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs of Smart Communications. Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Oily Oxales, who invited me here. To our fellows in the industry, good morning. The current digital infrastructure of the country is still not enough to realize an affordable and pass internet connectivity. One of the major issues we have identified is the regulatory constraints that hinder telecommunications companies to further invest in the infrastructure of the country. The ideal telecommunications ecosystem is what we want to achieve in the country. We want to have thousands of telecommunications towers erected throughout the archipelago connected to the fiber backbone through fiber backhaul, preferably. We want to establish in-building solutions in every building so that stronger signals will be distributed inside structures, especially in central business districts. Signals can also be distributed to various households through common poles. However, we still have a ways to go to achieve this eco ideal ecosystem. The existing towers and fibers built are not yet enough to reach the model tower to subscription ratio, which is about one tower to about 100 or 200 households. We've yet to utilize existing poles or micro towers to provide wider coverage extensively especially in central business districts where constructing towers is exceedingly difficult due to limited space and oftentimes exorbitant fees for leasing these areas. The government's approach is two-pronged. First, I will discuss the progressive regulations and policies, and uh, I will just briefly breeze through the catalytic programs and projects uh, that we are doing. The progressive regulations and policies, as you know, is focused on easing regulatory burdens, both from a cost, time, and the, the sheer number of permits needed. And our, and our programs is not meant to compete. It is there to ignite and spur growth and expand to places where there is little to no digital infrastructure build out, as uh, Dindo uh, pointed out earlier.
In July last year, the DICT together with other national government agencies issued the JMC or the Joint Memorandum Circular on Power Permitting, which already streamlined the process of issuing necessary permits and reduce the documentary requirements needed to construct towers in the country. The policy is on its way to fast track the deployment of internet across the country as it allows and encourages telcos and independent tower companies to build cell towers at a very accelerated rate. I believe uh, for this year alone, about 5,000 tower permits have are ready for, uh, towers are ready for construction. In keeping with the joint memorandum circular, there is a provision there that the DICT is supposed to launch a tower registration and permitting system that will allow not to add for the not to add any step, no. But this is the DICT's response in making sure that the registration of companies engaged in the business of establishing or operating the shared cell towers are properly monitored for all parties concerned. The online portal contains information such as the list of documentary requirements and the procedures and how to qualify and register an ITC, as well as the coming phases. The system shall present dashboards that showcase the, task, the status of each registration and application submitted. It has dedicated dashboards for the, for the applicant tower companies, the anti-red tape authority. So they will actually know which particular application is getting stranded at which particular point or uh, which agency, all the way to the area and to the location. The DICT, of course, which will also help uh, uh, push the permits forward and the LGUs. The LGUs will have a very clear visibility of where each and every specific application is. We don't have to be very particular to the specific location no? because uh, I think those are, uh, we understand the proprietiness of those, uh, of those information for each telco. As well as the other national government agencies, the PWH, uh, FDA, CAAP, and the ones involved. Through these, the users will see in real time the status of each application and the number of days it takes or it has taken for a certain permit to be issued. The government understands the plight of the private companies that the private companies face in this journey of helping build the country's digital infrastructure. Thus, we strive to continue to evaluate and improve our processes for the benefit of the Filipino public. Uh, last February 22, we are delighted to share that in, the in that cabinet meeting, the president has approved the DICT's proposals to institute additional regulatory frameworks aimed at a quicker rollout of key digital infrastructures. So in the cabinet meeting where all the secretaries are there, we were able to garner the support of the president and he, he ordered that the following agencies uh, immediately uh, work on the following directives. There is a cabinet directive, uh, cabinet directive already for this. Um, under the leadership of our secretary, Gregorio Onasan II, the DICT is working on these milestone policies to lay down the foundations of digital connectivity and access programs. The most important of which is the common poll policy or in the, uh, the attendant joint memorandum circular on fiber polls, as well as in building solutions. So that's on the top of the list. Um, we are also pursuing a spectrum management policy to liberalize the use, allocation, and Refarming of the of the spectrum. This will allow a level playing field for all players. Once, additionally, we are exploring regulations that necessitate the use of in-building solutions, which are small antennas placed on the ceilings. I think the telcos, the telco people know here what those are about. But the the key per, the key landmark 
uh, the key milestone we achieved in that cabinet meeting is that uh, it is ordered that the DHSUD and the DILG will soon issue the regulatory framework for necessitating in-building solutions as a, a necessary a step towards attaining occupancy permit. Just like water, power, and sewerage, sewerage uh, the building occupants would have the service and it is already considered a basic utility. Through these regulatory frameworks that the department is spearheading, we are not easing the burden of for telcos to perform their duties. We are not only easing their burdens, we are also liberalizing the market, therefore allowing smaller players in this industry to enter and participate. The next part, of course, is on the right, the catalytic programs and projects. Many of you have already heard of this several times in our in our other forums, but for the benefit of everyone, the three main programs that the government itself is do, are doing are the national broadband, the free Wi-Fi, and the national government data center. We call them catalytic programs because our objective is to accelerate the growth of fiber and power built out in places where uh, otherwise, it would not be commercially viable for our private uh, enterprises to build out. So then the, the government's response in making the national broadband program is lighting up the NGCP fiber backbone that we have. But we're also exploring new ways of doing this by leasing uh, existing dark fibers or excess capacities from the, telecommunic uh, the telco industries in this in the whole archipelago. We have also partnered uh, with the LGUs to help us expand their middle and last mile. So we are engaging the LGUs to accelerate the fiber build out in their own provinces and cities with partnerships with their own respective local players for this. Oh. We have already inked several MOUs with the provinces from Bataan, Baguio, Tarlac, Zambales, even as far as Negros Occidental. And most recently, we have inked uh, MOUs with Agusan. And soon, uh, it will be Davao and, and Cagayan de Oro. The purpose of this is that for the provincial broadband networks to already be ready while we're building the national fiber backbone. As I said earlier, we're involving local telcos also to utilize their dark fibers for resiliency of the NBP. To provide context, the free Wi-Fi for all program is, to, is geared towards putting last mile connectivity to areas where otherwise it will not be feasible uh, to lay down the fiber. So if you will notice, many of which is actually uh, VSAT oriented, but there are also fiber based uh, free Wi Fi installations we have done, especially last year as we put uh, internet connectivity to the rural health units, uh, as well as state universities and colleges. This year, the focus will be to light up also 5,000 vaccination centers. And lastly, our efforts of the National Government Data Center is geared towards reducing latency, at least for the government uh, hosted uh, e services. Uh, of course, we seek your invaluable support, invest your time, expertise, and resources to strengthen our digital infrastructure for the country. Together, we could help build bigger, better, and quicker internet for the Filipino people. For Digital Philippines in the new normal, thank you and stay safe, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, Asik and thank you, Asik and uh, Yeah, thank you really for, for sharing. I really like what you said about having a telecommunications ecosystem in the Philippines. Sounds like something that, would, that we really need and, and I appreciate you sharing some of the progressive policy reforms and initiatives of the DICT. Um, I hope you can stay for some 
some questions later on. Uh, so uh, next up, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Mr. Orlando Oxalis, the convener of Citizen Watch. And he's here to discuss an initiative of Citizen Watch with the DICT called Telecom Tower Advocacy, Telecom Tower Watch Advocacy. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, turn the floor, turn the mic over to Mr. Orly of Salas. Hi. Uh, thank you very much, Paco. Um, before I start my little talk, I I'd like to uh, express our uh, sincere appreciation for uh, Strathbase ADRI, uh, Professor Dindon Mahit, the president, for hosting again another one of our advocacies. Um, thank you, Yusek uh, Panikaintik, for uh, gracing this occasion. Uh, we, we are looking forward to working with you uh, in this very important uh, advocacy. And uh, of course, uh, very important also is uh, our uh, partners here in the telecommunications industry. Uh, thank you for attending uh, this uh, very uh, relevant forum. Uh, let me just share my screen, share my presentation. Uh, is it visible now? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Um, this morning, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Telecom Tower Watch. Telecom Tower Watch is a monitoring and consultation initiative of the DICT in partnership with Citizen Watch Philippines that aims to support the accelerated building of digital infrastructure projects. This advocacy will establish a regular venue for close monitoring and troubleshooting of unnecessary delays in the building of all telecommunications towers and related projects. The project will have an online awareness campaign that will provide current information on the status of ongoing telecommunications infrastructure projects. It will also have a series of consultative meetings that would gather government, private sector, and other stakeholders to tackle issues, find solutions, and align strategies towards the fast expansion and upgrading of the country's digital infrastructure. Hopefully, this ven venue will actually expand further with the participation of the whole Philippine digital, digital ecosystem. While the COVID-19 pandemic persists as a long emergency that stifles economic growth, it has also exposed the Philippines' competence in the rapid digital transformation that society has been hurled into. The fundamental solution is a whole of society approach that is characterized with government supportive policies and massive public private investments towards the development of telecommunication services. As socioeconomic systems evolve in the new normal, the adoption of digital tools, cloud-based technology and other online transactions have been brought to the fore. All these will need fast, reliable, and affordable internet connectivity from mobile and fixed line broadband networks. Economic recovery will be slow and protracted without digital infrastructure supporting this foundation. In a hyperlinked society connected via the internet, all sectors of society depend on it for continued business operations, education, transportation, health-related concerns, information dissemination, and delivery of public services. Dependable internet services will allow fast digitization of government bureaucracies and private industries to become competitive in the context of complying to the minimum safety protocols to safely live and work in pandemic conditions. The outputs we see here is First is to gather and organize data of all telecom tower and priority digital infrastructure projects, operationalize an online reporting and posting mechanism on the status of digital infrastructure projects, flag 
permitting guideline violations and permitting delays, flag project delays to DICT and concerned parties for appropriate action, and regular media briefings on new developments. As we continue to face the pandemic, the accelerated digital transformation of society needs increased and sustained support from the public and private sectors. Digital innovation and adopting new technologies have been a vital part of surviving the pandemic and our crisis response. Moving forward, these same tools can revive and future-proof our economy, create jobs for the unemployed, and ensure business continuity. Cloud-based technologies have enabled us with safe and efficient connectivity to engage in all essential activities to survive, thrive, and most certainly indispensable in our recovery towards pre-pandemic prosperity. If the government's vision is to deliver digital services to all, government must invest in our digital infrastructure likewise. We must have the digital infrastructure to deliver the broadband speeds to run all the cloud-based services we need. Just as we can't afford delaying deployment of safe and effective vaccines, we can't afford the handicap of a lagging telecommunications infrastructure. After decades of hesita hesitation and bureaucratic resistance to the disruptive solutions of information and communications technology, we all know that this is the only way to go. Indeed, the acceleration of the country's digital transformation should be the priority in the government's recovery strategies. Government investments in strategic telecommun telecommunications infrastructure will promote an economic revival that will unleash the country's digital potential to become a key player in a digitized global economy. Digital technologies have become an indispensable extension of our physical and mental being. The warnings of inherent risks may be valid, but very manageable. And experiencing the advantages, accessibility, and great utility of digitalization is the big lesson of this crisis that will continue to shape the new normal. Aggressive investments already being done by the private telecommunications companies to expand and improve internet service will accelerate rapidly if the government steps in to build a nationwide broadband backbone that will integrate with tower and fiber networks of private telcos. Investing heavily in telecommunications networks is a proven strategy working well for our ASEAN neighbors that if delayed, or much worse, neglected, will leave us less competitive and may worsen the already deep economic slump. We can only emerge from the COVID crisis as a competitive economy if we can keep up with an increasingly, increasingly digitally driven global economy. We cannot and should not be left behind in the new digital world. Citizen Watch Philippines stands with Filipino consumers in supporting the call for the government to work with the private sector for economic progress. We call for increased public and private partnerships, which will foster a future-proofed Philippines with the full adoption of digital solutions and technologies. Let us continue to build meaningful intersectoral cooperation and build towards a digitally robust Philippines for the benefit of all Filipino citizens. We believe that the interconnectedness of society in the post-pandemic era is through digital connection. The best way to move forward from this pandemic is to strengthen our capacities through digital transformation. Let us forge a future fortified with digital infrastructures. Thank you very much, Paco. Thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Osales. Thank you already for, for telling us all about your Citizen Watch's initiative, the ICT's initiative, Citizen Watch, rather. 
example, Telecom Tower Watch, it, it seems very promising. And I, I look forward to how that uh, unfolds. At the same time, you know, as a consumer group, it's also valuable for us and our participants to hear, you know, how, what kind of economic impact uh, tech, you know, telecommunications and technology has on, on, on consumers and Filipinos in general. Um, so yes, uh, with that, we now want to hear some of the perspectives from the telecommunications industry. Now, uh, as you've seen from our, our poster, we have, we have three speakers here from, from the industry. We were hoping, but as you know also, that we have actually more than, than two telcos now in the Philippines. Uh, and we were hoping to get them here as well. But uh, perhaps we can just save them as speakers for, for our follow-up event. Um, but anyway, uh, first up, to share his perspectives from the telecommunications industry is Mr. Vince Tempoco. Mr. Vince Tempoco is the Vice President for Site Acquisition and Management at Globe Telecom. Vince, good morning. Good morning, Paco. Thank you for the introduction. Um, good morning to everyone, all the speakers and uh, the audience. Um, and thank you also, Paco and Dindo, for having me today. Okay, so let me share my presentation. So I hope everyone can see my presentation. Okay, so um, before I start, um, I'd like to share Globe's uh, vision, mission, and purpose to set the context of my presentation today. So um, Globe sees a Philippines where dreams come true, families, dreams come true, businesses flourish, and the nation is admired. And to do our part, we create wonderful experiences for people to have choices, overcome challenges, and discover new ways to enjoy life. In everything we do, we treat, right, treat people right to create a globe of good. Okay. Globe's vision of nation building and enabling businesses to flourish pushes us to adapt to the ever-changing digital demands in this new normal. Despite the effects of um, the pandemic, Globe maintained its commitment to its customers to provide connectivity and new experiences even at home. We launched products that allowed our customers to remain connected. Partnerships were also forged to ensure we continue to provide great service to every home especially that members of the family are either working from home or busy with online classes. An example of this partnership is our partnership with MMDA. Okay. Uh, traditionally, um, we have the Metro Manila Film Festival uh, held every December and Filipinos would flock to the cinemas to watch um, the movies participating in the MMFF. Because of the pandemic, we are unable to do so. And Globe and MMDA partner together to be able for people to be able to stream these movies uh, from their homes. Apart from providing connectivity, Globe has been one with the frontliners and has been active with its CSR activities. We have donated COVID test kits, PPEs, face masks, and other essential supplies to help them battle this pandemic. Overall, Globe has provided over 1.3 billion worth in combined services and assistance package for COVID-19. The need for, for us to be digital has never been more important than during this time, as many Filipinos remain at home and rely on digital technologies to cope with the challenges and continue managing their daily lives. This has accelerated the move to digital at a speed that would not have been achieved under normal circumstances. With the customer safety and public in general as its utmost priority, Globe has developed digital services that minimize their exposure to the deadly respiratory disease. These include digital channels such as Globe One, Globe at Home app, and Gcash. An example, Globe One app as you can see in the slide, okay, allows Globe Postpaid, Globe My Business, Prepaid, and even TM customers to monitor their accounts, track their usage, 
pay their bills, and even redeem their Globe rewards. To add, prepaid customers can also purchase load and register to promos using this application. So by using these apps, subscribers can do all their Globe transactions without leaving their homes. Globe promotes online education and online health consultations as well. We are working with the Department of Education and even with LGUs to boost distance learning as a method of education adapts to the new normal and when physical face-to-face -face learning is not yet possible. I believe we have already a partnership with uh, Manila and Quezon City in providing um, the students in these cities no, with uh, connectivity, with their connectivity requirements. Globe is also with the Department of Health in encouraging telemedicine health consultation with, it, with our Consulta MD service. Through this service, a customer can call Consulta MD and talk to its doctors regarding their health concerns. Aside from being practical, Consulta MD also protects a customer from unnecessary exposure to COVID-19. We also encourage fintech use and promote digital transactions through our GCash service. With quarantine restrictions imposed and physical distancing a must, Globe enabled its customers and the general public with the capability to conduct online business and convenient, safe, real-time cashless transactions through GCash. In 2020, GCash became the number one finance app and currently has 33 million registered users, including a 3.7 times increase in active users. With all of these users and activities, GCash reached a gross transaction value of over 1 trillion pesos. GCash provides businesses and individuals with features and benefits such as one, the pay on, you go fee, pay on the go feature, which is used for cashless disbursements of salaries, incentives, allowances, not only for employees, but for vendors and partners. Uh, number two, scan to pay for QR code, contactless payments in stores, and upload QR codes in app. Third, it also provides fast, reliable domestic remittance via its send money feature. With Gcash, merchants, retailers, government, and netizens enjoy the advantages and benefit of a digital and cashless society. Digital transfer nation cannot happen without reliable connectivity. Globe has been aggressively investing in and expanding its network to provide better internet connections. Cell sites indeed are needed to enhance signal penetration and to improve the internet speeds for a better digital experience. In this slide, is a graph from Yugatech, which was published recently. It shows that the Philippines suffers from low site density compared to our neighboring countries, such as Vietnam and Thailand. This is due to the lack of cell sites in relation to the number of internet users. We are behind the likes of Vietnam and Thailand when it comes to cell sites to internet users ratio. And uh, to add, Vietnam and Thailand also are ahead and enjoy, you know, government invents investments in telecom infrastructure. The network cannot expand its capacity without building more towers or cell sites. This is the key to improve the internet speeds in the country. In spite of the almost three month enhanced community quarantine in 2020, Globe achieved record breaking network rollout numbers. And this wouldn't have been possible without the help of the government with the release of the Joint Memorandum Circular on Tower Permitting and the signing of the Bayanihan II law. And of course, the support of the DILG and ARTA, um, the permitting process was simplified. As you can see, we were able to get 1,900 permits from July to November 2020. And this is Six, more than six, almost six times no? more than what we got in the same time frame in the previous year. Okay. This allowed us to build 
1,300 cell site towers in 2020. This is 18% higher than what we built in 2019. No? Again, this is in spite of the almost three month ECQ period that we experienced last year. And we were also able to upgrade 11,500 4G LTE sites. And uh, this uh, provides additional capacity to all our cell sites that were upgraded. And we encourage people who are still on 3G to upgrade their SIMs and phones to 4G so that they can experience better internet speeds. We also have over 1,000 sites now with 5G, which brought about 80% uh, of NCR now covered by 5G or with 5G. Fiber rollout also increased 275%, allowing us to reach more homes in 2020. Globe continues to lead the charge in building sites with 2,400 new cell site towers built in the past two years. And now we have a total of 10,600 sites nationwide. Internet speeds have also improved. There were significant increases in both the globe fixed broadband and mobile data speeds, as seen here in the graph coming from UCLA, okay, a global speed index index. No? This is while supporting an increase, no? A, an increase of 226% in at-home broadband subscribers in a data traffic of 352 petabytes in 2020 from just 77 petabytes in 2019. There was also a 50% year-on-year increase from, 20, 20 to 20, from 2019 in mobile data traffic. Okay. Globe's average video and app calling experience have also beaten the global average improvement with 16 percent and 2.5 percent improvement respectively. While we continue to invest billions of pesos in the network, Globe has also made internet service more affordable with pricing that is competitive versus our neighboring countries. So as you can see here in, in the graphs, no? Globe prepaid broadband internet has gone down uh, to nine pesos per GB whilst our mobile prepaid promos are now at 11 pesos and 25 centavos, centavos per GB, which is very competitive versus our, versus our neighbors, such as Indonesia, Singapore, and Thailand. Globe has lofty targets for 2021, as we aim to build 1 million fiber lines, 2,000 sites, uh, of course, with the help of the Tower Coast, and expand our 5G uh, coverage even further. Okay. And this is with a total investment of 70 billion pesos, which is close to 50% of our revenues. Tower Coast have come in the Philippines, and Tower Coast will supplement the investments and in build of the Tower Telcos which will allow us to further accelerate our cell site build. Globe currently has engaged over 10 tower coasts, and we have already sites using shared infrastructure as seen in um, the lower left uh, PR attached to this slide. Um, though the government has made permitting easier for us, um, unfortunately, cell site health fears continue to persist and prevent us from building inside villages and private properties. We want to reassure everyone that cell sites are safe and do not pose any health risks to people. And according to the World Health Organization, studies to date indicate that environmental exposure to RF does not increase the risk of cancer or any disease. Right? And 5G does not cause COVID, as people have claimed. Globally, cell sites are installed in public places, such as stadiums, theme parks, schools, and hospitals. In the Philippines, hospitals such as FEU and RMF in St. Luke's Global 
have allowed Globe to put up cell sites in their buildings to provide connectivity to their doctors and staff. In summary, Globe continues to lead the charge in cell site build, and now with 10,600 sites. We continue to build more facilities with the objective of providing first world internet to the Filipinos. The government has helped the telcos in our network build through the JMC and Bayanihan Tulo that simplify the permitting process. We continue to work with the government, especially ARTA, in the further streamlining of the permitting process. We continue to seek the support of the private sector by allowing us to co-locate our sites in their properties and in their villages. Lastly, we look forward to everyone's support so that we can push the digital transformation to the Philippines to greater heights. Thank you and good morning to all. Thanks, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Thanks, Mr. Vince Tempoco, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, Vince, you said a lot of nice, uh, a lot of interesting things, but what stuck out to me is people think that 5G can cause COVID-19? Yes. Oh, that, that's, uh... <laughs> um, from a personal experience, we have um, certain building owners mm -hmm. or private property owners who have uh, prevented us from upgrading our sites to become 5G capable because of the reason. They think that 5G one causes COVID or sometimes 5G causes um, risks to even animals. No? Um, mm -hmm. and people can get very absurd no? when it comes to re reasons in, uh, mm -hmm. that prevent us from, from uh, upgrading our cell sites. Wow. 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 So at uh, least, ladies and gentlemen, it's one key takeaway from today's event that uh, 5G does not cause COVID-19 straight from Mr. Vince here. Uh, but but more, on a more serious note, uh, you mentioned earlier, you know, the, the exponential increase in, you know, the beta, uh, petabyte. Yes. So that's data, data traffic, right? So, yes. um, on your network. And, and that reminded me actually of uh, a virtual town hall the discussion we, we at, at um, ADRI hosted in January with Stanford mm -hmm. Club. And uh, we had speakers from Netflix, from Grab, from uh, all of these, you know, these these tech giants that we use. And it made me realize, yeah, we really have been changing our behavior and our consumption over the past years. And, and, and I'm sure over the last year specifically, um, do you see this, this trend of growth continuing? I, I mean, I, we know the answer, but I wanted to hear it from you. How, how do you set, see this trend of data consumption growing? Um, of course, as we accelerate the digital transformation here in our country, um, we will continue to experience uh, this data traffic exponential growth, no? so to speak, um, especially with the new normal where people are at home. Everything that was done outside is now all done at home. No? Everything is consumed at home. Um, people no longer watch movies in the cinemas, but rather watch movies at home, which obviously drives the traffic uh, uh, up no? uh, significantly. Um, just like what we're doing right now, and we would have done this in a uh, in a uh, in more a, in public, a boardroom, uh, yeah. the boardroom, or in a public place, right? Mm -hmm. But now we're doing Zoom, and obviously, while we're doing this, we're consuming uh, data traffic, right? Or, right. or yeah, so yeah, please expect a lot of growth as far as data traffic is concerned, and that's why we continue to invest a lot of money in our network. Because one, we need to catch up, no? make sure that people continue to enjoy what they're enjoying now. And two, also to even increase our speeds no? in spite of, and the experience in spite of the increasing data traffic. So it's really, um, for us, it's really a moving target, so to speak, right? So, because we're chasing after that is continuously growing. Right, right. And, and I imagine as you know, Globe and you have Smart here also continuing to build cell sites to keep up with demand. That I imagine, like given the exponential growth of of uh, of consumption, that at a certain point, you know, you you need some help, right? <laughs> it can't just be yep. the, the the telcos 
these two or three, however many, how many you want to count them now, uh, being you know in charge of building the infrastructure. Uh, yes. Yeah, of course. Um, we need everyone's help. Um, we obviously have gotten a lot of help from the government as far as permitting process concerned, and we do still welcome additional support uh, coming from uh, the government. Uh, I think you said. Uh, uh, mentioned earlier um, some programs that will help uh, the telcos even further and we do welcome this no? and as mentioned earlier um, we continue to seek help from uh, the private sector to allow us to build our cell sites in our facilities allow us in your villages no? and whatnot no? so there right. Right. definitely there there's that not in my backyard mentality I yes, think correct. at play here and then we have to get over it because uh, at the end of the day, even the people who don't want it in their backyard use the internet, right? Correct. Are using and it they now. have their, their smartphones with them. Right. Yeah. In their pocket. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. right beside their, uh, their private and parts. Some of them even complaining so. about uh, poor signal. Right. Mm, right. So. right. So, yeah. well, yes. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, and, and definitely in addition to that, I, there's that social aspect. There's that educational, you know, understanding aspect, but I guess I imagine there's also that uh, that in the provinces, perhaps that there are other ISPs as well. I, I, that's something that I realized just recently. Yeah. So there are other ISPs that also are building infrastructure in these provinces, right? And and they, along with you guys at the government, mm -hmm. play a, a central role in in uh, connecting everybody. Yeah. So that's an interesting. Interesting insight there. So, thanks, thanks, Vince. Uh, I know that you, you you might have to run in a few, so I wanted to get a few questions in there before sure. you did. Uh, I have a question, if I if I may, is it allowed to, uh, right now? Sure, sure. If you if you have one, why don't you? Uh, yeah, let's uh, have a panel discussion a little bit. Uh, just just one, okay? Just one, Ashu, because we have to move on, move on to Roy. Um, and um, basically, it caters to. The previous presentations uh, to the government policies um, okay. uh, and also the um, telecom like the globe. Um, you know, uh, everyone knows Philippines uh, is uh, 7,641 islands, uh, out of which uh, probably uh, around 2,000 of them they are inhabited, and uh, close to 5,000 are uh, of islands are still yet to be named. Um, and uh, what, what COVID has uh, shown us uh, that uh, with the help of telecommunication, uh, the connectivity, uh, basically uh, the people, there's an opportunity that the uh, cities can be decongested. Uh, these islands, uh, remote areas can be habitated. Uh, people can uh, utilize the environmental friendly remote islands uh, for their uh, and they can open small offices or small uh, residential things where the real estate will be cheaper, it will be more environmental friendly. And with the help of connectivity, uh, fiber optic uh, of these islands, um, these remote areas will really benefit. And with the help of artificial intelligence and uh, uh, all these technologies together, whether uh, a full virtual city can be uh, established without really opening the uh, tangible infrastructure uh, in that place. So uh, I'm, my, my only question from the uh, globe and uh, any uh, telco and also the government is, are there any initiatives in plan where uh, uh, there is a public partnership, uh, pu public and private partnerships to habitate these remote areas, which are not maybe uh, economical lucrative at this moment of time, of course, everyone wants to have 5G in Manila and put all the money there, but remote areas uh, should also get some uh, benefit out of this COVID <clears throat> opportunity. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Ashley. Maybe we could give Vince uh, the floor to maybe if he wants to answer that. And then let's take that. We'll take note of the question and then ask it later on in the, in the open forum for the rest of the speakers. So, Vince, did, did you want to say anything to... Um, we do recognize that, uh, well, one of the challenges in the Philippines, as far as network rollout is concerned, is it, the Philippines is an archipelago. It has 7,000 islands, okay? 
and it's quite challenging to bring in um, capacity to these uh, areas. Okay, bringing in cell sites and fiber optic can be uh, quite expensive, especially we'll have to do submarine cables and whatnot. No? And uh, probably this is one of the areas where we can seek help from the government. Okay, to help us uh, roll out to these areas and uh, help us uh, together with other telcos, no, share infrastructures. Um, that could uh, help bring in um, connectivity to these far-flung areas. And we'd be more than willing uh, to bring in our, our service to these areas uh, if we're able to, you know, uh, government's able to help defray some of the costs, right? And uh, another thing that we're also doing, as mentioned earlier, is uh, we have top tower coasts or tower companies, okay? And as you know, these towers will be shared across uh, multiple telcos and uh, Hopefully, this will also help uh, bring down the cost of uh, bringing in uh, our service to these far-flung areas. <clears throat> Great. Yeah, thanks, Vince. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, I wish you could stay a bit more, but... Uh, <laughs> I, can, I can say, I can say. Yeah? Um, oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's good, that's good. All right, so uh, next up, we'll, uh, we'll move to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Mr. Roy Ebay. Vice President for Legal and Regulatory Affairs at Smart Communications. Attorney Ibai, uh, we're interested to hear from you as well, from Smart. Hi, magandang umaga. Good morning, Good morning. Uh, uh, Professor Dindo Manhit. Of course, Yusek uh, Manika Intik, uh, we congratulate uh, the ICT and uh, Stratbase no, for leading this initiative. And uh, of course, uh, thank you also, Paco, Orly, uh, to my colleague uh, from the industry, Vince, uh, and also Ashutosh Bargava. I hope I uh, got that correctly. Uh, former Congressman Terry Ridon is also here. And to the rest of the other guests uh, and uh, panelists, uh, good morning. So um, may we, uh, can I ask uh, uh, Christina? to uh, flash my presentation, please. Uh, what? John, okay, thank you, John. So first, next slide, please. So, okay. So uh, why are we all doing this? Of course, more than contributing to the betterment of the economy, I think uh, Mr. Murdoch uh, has put it uh, plainly that the advances in the technology of telecommunication have proved an unambiguous threat to totalitarian regimes everywhere. So it's basically, uh, it has ensured our basic freedoms no? so many times in history. And even now, I think the best example is what's happening in Myanmar. No? Uh, good thing there's still uh, some telecommunication firms that are operating there and uh, a lot of what's happening in Myanmar, we're still uh, uh, discovering and we're still getting updated no, through the power of um, telecoms. So uh, next slide, please. So um, let me give you an update as to where the PLDT group is at no, with regards to our wireless and fixed uh, infrastructure. Was, uh, that was specifically asked of me. Uh, when I asked Orly, well, what am I supposed to talk about today? <laughs> so, well, on, on the physical sites, as you, as you may see, um, uh, we have on the wireless side, as of uh, end of January, 10,150 sites. And our presence in terms of um, 3G is about 94% nationwide. Our LTE is also 94% uh, nationwide. On the base station count, as of end uh, 2020, we have 59,236 base stations. Of course, this is combined 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G. And this was a 21% increase from the uh, number as of end of year end 2019. Next slide, please. So, on the fiber footprint, uh, as of end 2020, there was a 133% increase. Uh, we now have uh, 
as end of um, 2020, 429,270 kilometers of fiber, uh, which is uh, a big increase, no? about 133% from the year end figure of 322,356 kilometers. And uh, in terms of activated fiber to the home ports, for fixed, there was also a 125% increase from the year end uh, figure of uh, 2.35 million fiber to the home um, ports activated to year end 2020, 2.88 uh, million uh, homes. No, while in the homes past, there's there was a uh, from 7.23 we increased to about 9.04. Next slide, please. For wireless permits, there was a 190% increase in terms of permits issued. No? And for that, of course, we thank uh, the Joint Memorandum Circular issued last year by the DICT, the, the ARTA, and the ARTA, and um, other agencies like PILG and uh, the NPC, and of course, the Bayanihan II uh, law, which uh, supported also that. Uh, JMC, no. And they're actually uh, in many in many um, uh, congressional hearings, we have also publicly thanked uh, the ICT, no, for uh, a lot of um, instances, including the NPC, where uh, well, these are all uh, unsigned or unwritten uh, uh, memos, but they they facilitated a lot of times, no, our access in a lot of uh, areas. Uh, barangays, um, locations where it was previously uh, inaccessible because of the pandemic, where they had a lot of uh, different rules being applied by different barangays and uh, LGUs, but they helped us. No, they helped us to enter, they helped us to repair, they helped us to install uh, uh, our facilities therein. So, um, as of end of um, quarter one, uh, in comparison to the end of quarter four. In terms of fixed, there was a 467% increase in terms of, uh, um, next slide please, sorry. So in terms of permitting, as I said, no, uh, in, in, in terms of wireless permits from July to August, there was a 190% increase in wireless permits. And for fixed, uh, in comparison to end of quarter one to end of quarter four, there was a 467% increase in the number of permits uh, released. So. Wireless permits, as you look, as you see there on this slide, include includes barangay resolution, building permits, uh, CFEI uh, certificate of final inspection, electrical inspection, and work permits. No? Uh, fixed permits includes barangay resolution, DPWH, LGU, right to attach, and right of way permits. So, uh, as I said, the various programs of government at Bayanihan Akin Arta help accelerate our rollout by streamlining the permitting process. No? requiring on only for municipal permits. However, there are still a number of barangays do not honor the JMC guidelines and continue to require other permits. So uh, on this, we would like to see clarity on the new Bayanian Act 2 guideline that HOAS may now require consent contrary to the ARTE directive. This, I think, is now being currently discussed no? because uh, as I uh, understand, the ARTA and the DICT and the NTC now are discussing uh, further um, amending uh, the current guidelines to to try and uh, reconcile a lot of this uh, still um, uh, conflicting uh, resolutions. So next slide, please. Okay, so how does this affected the uh, the speed? No, as uh, discussed earlier by uh, Professor Manhit. Uh, well, the Philippines ranks. 110 out of 139 no, as of uh, November 2020 in global ranking, while it ranks 34th in Asia with speeds of 18.49 Mbps. Now, if um, smart in terms of mobile speed would have ranked 28th in Asia behind Russia with average speeds of 23.1 Mbps. This was as of November. No? So we'd have been... Uh, Higher in, uh, by six uh, by six slots, no. If uh, 
if it is to be considered. Next slide, please. So for Southeast Asia, in terms of uh, mobile, the Philippines ranks nine in Southeast Asia, while Smart would have ranked eight with an average speed of 23.1 Mbps. Next slide, please. Okay, for fixed, uh, while the Philippines ranks 103 out of 176 in global ranking, and it ranks 29th in Asia uh, with speeds of 28.69 Mbps, our uh, fixed line PLDT would have ranked 23 in Asia with an average speed of 34.42 Mbps. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of uh, Southeast Asia, the Philippines ranked sixth in Southeast Asia and our fixed uh, line PLDT would have ranked fifth with speeds of 34.42 Mbps. Next slide, please. Okay, so while uh, we're talking about, uh, of course, uh, how a lot of uh, benefits no, that happened from last year, there are still basically a lot of problem areas being confronted by telcos. Number one, I just as this forum was uh, uh, starting, I asked our head of build uh, if uh, how... If the, the, if the target of the government to, to hasten the uh, permitting process from 200 days to 16 days, did it really happen? And their reply was that, no, it did not happen. The average number of days now, although drastically has been reduced, is uh, anywhere from um, uh, 30 to 60 days. No? So uh, that's, of course, still, still quite a feat. No? From 200 days, it's now down to a month to two months. But still, their, uh, the, their target of uh, achieving 16 days uh, is still uh, uh, well proving uh, difficult to achieve. But uh, well, here are some problem areas uh, that maybe we can run through. Number one, um, some local governments are still imposing unjust, excessive, oppressive, and confiscatory regulatory fees. No? And um, when you protest, they basically use that non-payment of these regulatory fees to withhold issuance of building and other local permits. Okay, number two, uh, some LGUs require that permit applications should still be approved by the city and municipal council. And in relation to that, uh, ordinances that require special use permit before telcos can secure a building permit are still in effect. A few are even collecting unreasonable fees. So next, some barangays insist that telcos should apply for resolution instead of barangay clearance, which may only be secured after public hearings. The Department of Human Settlement and Urban Development, Order Number 2020-009 on revised locational guidelines require only a barangay clearance in lieu of a barangay resolution. So the difference there is the barangay resolution, you need a vote from the entire Kagawad and the whole council, no? while the clearance is basically just a ministerial document that you secure from the head of the barangay. Next, some barangays refuse to issue clearance or resolution due to telcos' failure to secure neighbors or homeowners' associations' consent. Next, some HOAs are still objecting or opposing the construction of telecom towers within their subdivisions, despite the fact that there are no other available or suitable sites within the coverage area except the subject properties and said location will best serve the purpose of interconnectivity effectively and efficiently. Next slide, please. Now, homeowner associations are also collecting excessive fees. No, uh, They have business clearance fees and other HOAs, would you believe, even have profit sharing agreements that they try to impose upon telcos, some of which are recurring. These fees, if not paid, would deny us access to installation, repair, and maintenance works within the subdivision and village premises. We're also seeking the Revision of DPWH Department Orders number 73 and 26. Next, some LGUs are requiring telcos to remove overhead cable connection and to place them underground using fiber optic and to fix or remove dangling cables and dilapidated poles prior to issuance of permit. We're not against uh, setting order no, into all these uh, dangling wires and all that, but I think it should not be made a... Uh, a uh, requirement no, prior to an issuance of permit. 
Next, we have a few local governments are also implementing a one poll policy, meaning uh, there should only be one provider for uh, telecommunication polls. And sometimes this favors specific telcos in violation of computation laws. Next, we also have several pending applications for special land use permits and special use agreements in protected areas with DNR. And then uh, next, uh, we have the National Council of Indigenous Peoples as a long and tedious process also in securing permits, especially when we plan to set up sites in a lot of these ancestral domain areas. Uh, and then we also have some LGUs are withholding permits due to non-payment of real property tax on machineries and local franchise taxes despite the exemption granted to telcos pursuant to their franchise and existing laws. Okay, so what is the PLDP Smart Group? Uh, what are our, what we have been doing to contribute to the rise of digital infrastructure or growth of digital infrastructure in the Philippines? Next slide, please. Our massive network investments will continue, definitely. So for the past five years, we've spent about 260 billion. In 2019 alone, 45% of total service revenues amounted to 73 billion. Last year, it was a bit lower because of the uh, pandemic, which made us difficult to procure uh, equipment and other facilities. But we have earmarked up to 92 billion pesos this year uh, to finance uh, our OPEX uh, in terms of uh, expansion, in terms of uh, facilities and telecoms infrastructure rollout. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, we have already covered in terms of wireless 96% of the Philippines with an average download speed of 23 Mbps. This is as, uh, as of uh, November 2020. In Metro Manila, uh, we're happy to say that uh, we're about 32.8 Mbps average uh, download speed. So uh, next slide, please. And we also plan to elevate the Philippines to the global standard for uh, fixed, our minimum average broad to target a minimum average broadband speed of 20 Mbps. This can be accomplished by uh, migrating a lot of our legacy DSL copper subscribers to fiber and to uh, fiber like services. And for mobile, uh, we're targeting also a, uh, a minimum average speed of 30 Mbps in Metro Manila and key cities no? starting this year. And, uh, increase uh, thereafter no, every year. Next slide, please. We have always led in independent studies. Um, we have always won the uh, fastest fixed in mobile network, uh, according to UCLA. And even the uh, German uh, benchmark provider has awarded uh, SMART the best in test award, best rated broadband coverage, download and latency experience and also the open signal also has given us uh, a video experience score 42.2 better than the competition and national average so well aside from this uh, the PLDT smart has uh, been rolling out a lot of um, very good products that has made uh, internet affordable uh, the best value to our consumers and uh, we will uh, continue to to do so. Let me share just uh, in closing. You know, um, the GSMA and uh, also the ITU has uh, actually shown that um, the, um, the telecommunications economy, well, particularly the mobile economy, has already generated about 4.4% of the global gross domestic product and has contributed more than $3.3 trillion of added economic value in $200 billion more so year on year. The telecom industry uh, is believed to add $4.2 trillion to the global GDP from 2020 and onwards. The telecom ecosystem has created jobs. The mobile industry and related digital sectors has provided employment for more than 28.5 million people worldwide. And uh, globally, digital services will continue to spread while more than 5 billion people subscribe to a mobile service, more than 60% of the 
of the world's population are expected that, uh, that this number will uh, even could continue to increase as the number of unique subscribers is expected to hit 5.7 billion, while more than 4.7 will access the internet from their mobile phone. So uh, probably just as a wish list, we hope that uh, our, uh, our government will, will continue to provide a healthy telecom regulatory environment that will encourage investment just as it incentivizes competition. And this will of course lead to a digital infrastructure revolution. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. So mute. Uh, thank you, Attorney Ibai. Yeah, I, I liked how you started with uh, with your Myanmar example and, and really highlighting how technology is not just an economic, you know, plays an economic role, but also a social one as well. And, and also for highlighting all of the challenges that the industry still faces in terms of uh, building its network and developing its network further. Um, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Next up, our next speaker is Mr. Ashutosh Bargava. We, we heard a, a bit from him earlier. Uh, he's the business head for Subsea Telecom uh, of Prismian Group. He has worked for power and telecom subsea industries. He's a veteran of, of the industry with, an exper with experience of more than 20 years. And, he, and he's here to talk about uh, more perspectives from the telco industry, not just from globe and, and smart that we're very familiar with, but also from the subsea industries as well. Uh, Ashu? Ooh. Let's see. I'm sharing my presentation. Can you hear me? I can hear you and I can see your presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I really... Um, um, I'm very happy to be on this panel and honored to among um, uh, the regulatories and the industry people. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Ashu Bhargav. Uh, I belong to a company called Prismian Group, um, NSW. Uh, Prismian Group is the world's largest manufacturer of submarine cables and uh, the cables, uh, power and fiber optics. And it has a subsidiary called NSW, which is uh, a manufacturing submarine cable since 1899. Um, I have worked with companies like Siemens, Corning, General Cable. And since last three years, I'm heading the global business of submarine cables for Prismian uh, uh, Milan. I'm based out of Singapore. Right. Great. Uh, just a small uh, history. Uh, Prismian Group is now uh, uh, consists of three big companies, Prismian of Italy, Draca, and General Cable, of which NSW, the submarine cable provider, is part. Um, it's a truly global group um, spread over 15 countries. We also have a good presence in Philippines. Uh, China, Singapore, Asia Pacific, uh, Malaysia, um, and uh, we uh, have 25 R&D centers and around 30,000 people, and we have a re regular uh, revenue of $11 billion. The reason I'm on this panel is basically we want to uh, uh, emphasize the need of the backbone. Uh, the backbone is critical to have any infrastructure and any uh, futuristic activities like mobile, 5G, et cetera. So NSW, uh, which is a manufacturing submarine cable, uh, was founded in 1899. And since then, uh, manufacturing submarine cable and has been in Philippines since early 90s. And I will talk about that. I think one of the disadvantage of me speaking last is that all the good things have already been said about the need of data traffic, but so I will have an opportunity to skip it through. Uh, but very quickly, uh, the global internet traffic is growing 50% an year uh, on an official basis. And from 2009, it has grown from 24% of the world population to now 60, 65% um, in 2020. 
and COVID, uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic increased the users by 15% more than that would have done naturally uh, exponentially. So this is one of the challenges and opportunities for the telecom industry. Um, if you see uh, the global figures and if you compare Asia Pacific and more or less Philippines matches Asia Pacific, still 60% uh, of the population is not uh, are not using internet uh, in the sense they use internet on mobile, but proper internet usage is still missing. And so this offers a challenge as well as opportunity for the telcos to cater to this unserved market. Um, the speed and so the applications and the usage since 1992 has million times grown. It means in 1992, um, the global internet traffic was 100 GB per day. In 1997, it has grown 24 times. It became 100 GB per hour. Today, we have 1.5 million GB per second. So this is the growth that we are talking about in telecom. And we remember when we entered Philippines and South Asia in 1990s, uh, we had to justify uh, the need of connecting fiber optics to the islands. And today, I think this is a natural choice. Just a very quick, uh, my old slide uh, since 2019, uh, what a 60 second um, internet, uh, internet minute can do. Can you imagine uh, in one 60 second, 188 emails can be so, uh, sent, 700,000 hours of Netflix can be watched. Um, 90,000 people can tweet, uh, 4.5 million videos can be viewed, and so on. So a 60 second data traffic, when you provide, for example, uh, in desert, uh, when you don't have uh, water, so people uh, do not drink water. But once they have water, they start drinking. This is the same as uh, fiber optic and uh, communication. If the people living on remote islands, they do not have a facility and they're only dependent on the very expensive satellite communication, they are not using all these applications. Once they are provided with a cheap uh, and economical uh, data connectivity, the usage grows like anything. And we have seen in many, many parts of the world from Chile to Alaska to uh, remote uh, South American uh, uh, and South Asia that the islands and the remote areas, social, uh, uh, they have developed socially, and they also developed economically once they provided a fiber connection. Now, this is our plant in Germany where we manufacture submarine cables. It's based directly on the sea. Um, the direct loading can be done of the submarine cable into the ship and transported to the different areas. Since 1899, NSW has been manufacturing submarine cables. Now, um, Philippines, uh, so first of all, congratulations to the Philippines government. Uh, Philippines was among the first countries to, uh, let's say, uh, realize the need of connecting its remote islands. Till today, um, even today, 7,641 of total islands, only 2,000 to 2,500 islands have been connected. Like I said before, since 1990s, NSW, that then part of Siemens, uh, took part in a very, very prestigious project of PLDT. It was a pioneer project while connecting from north to south uh, Philippines, the three major uh, island group from Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao. So it was the world's largest repeaterless submarine project that time. Uh, it was finished uh, as a turnkey project within 18 months. So PLDT pioneered connecting uh, the islands with the submarine. Most of the South Asian countries, they were still dependent on satellite communication. So PLDT and the Philippines uh, is the torch bearer of connecting and providing the solid backbone. Now, what is um, what are the critical requirements of the backbone? As the, as the backbone words say, backbone has to be solid. If the backbone is weak, if backbone has compromises, the the building and the infrastructure that is built on that backbone can collapse. We are talking about 5G, we are talking about so many applications in the last five miles, but if the backbone is weak, these all, the, all these things will have problems. 
that is why many times you feel calls are dropping the internet is not um, internet connectivity is not stable and there are a lot of outages so that's why it's very critical to have a resilient backbone it means both resilience and reliability in quality and security now quality we all understand the quality uh, products and experience products has to be used they have to be solid there should not be any compromise on the short term capex uh, uh, gains or cheap product um, uh, from um, unexperienced vendors so that's why quality is very important on in addition to the quality the security is also important the cyber security the the manufacturer basis the manufacturer should be reliable uh, you know and you can imagine all the things that are related to the national security defense security the security of the and also the protection of the network is very important um, in addition to that um, because of philippines um, and also a wider global environmental sensitivity nowadays sustainability is very important so the when we talk about permitting when we talk about any permissions and design of the network the products with the lowest carbon footprint have to be used and this is where uh, our company and uh, um, and prism companies and many other uh, international uh, uh, good companies they are focusing on sustainability when they take uh, when they consider designing of the products also so and of course uh, uh, we already discussed this part in the morning permitting uh, standard procedures and the fixed response time the sla from the government means fixed response time is very much important and required for, by the industry we have done um, a lot of uh, projects uh, uh, already um, as a submarine projects uh, connecting different parts of philippines islands uh, since 1997 um uh, we have worked with for pldt also we have provided uh, our cables uh, to uh, globe uh, directly and indirectly so nsw prisbian is present uh, in a very big way uh, in telecom industry uh, in philippines and we will be happy to give our global experience uh, to philippines authorities and also to the philippines customers um not only in telecom um i think uh, we discussed this there's a need of uh, uh, there is a need of combining power and the fiber so uh, prisbian being the number one cable producer we have been connecting uh, fiber including uh, the power cable including fibers uh, and we have connected lot of islands in philippines these are the few examples um, that we have uh, our of our projects this is of the last one and this is the latest order that we are just executing so if like i said if you connect the remote areas covid has given us opportunity it has given us the opportunity and realization that people can sit wherever they want and work remotely the virtual infrastructure can be created the key is the reliable communication connectivity when uh, we have seen in many remote parts of the world that uh, remote uh, countries and remote areas have uh, benefited uh, with the submarine cable connectivity because they can open the schools which are run on remote learning they have telemedicine the hospitals are running on the specialist remote learning uh, telemedicine uh, is very very successful in south america and caribbean islands um, and uh, of course the 5g network and 5g network will bring a lot of other opportunity opportunities to these remote islands so the the overall development of philippines especially philippines with having 8000 islands um, can only happen when the remote areas of philippines are developed and where we can uh, guide and maybe give our consulting uh, services to the government Uh, taking examples live examples of what has happened uh, what has been happening around the world from chile new zealand um, south america uh, and other remote parts of the world uh, where um, uh, indonesia for example where the government has collaborated uh, with um, the private players to develop these areas so this is a small presentation from our side i'll be happy to answer anything uh, any questions on this regard my email is given thank you very much
All right. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Ashu. Yeah, th those figures going back to 1992, that was something, right? Uh, that indeed is the, the exponential growth that we've been talking about earlier in the, in, in the town hall. Um, but also I like it how you brought in, you know, issues of national security, sustainability, education, because it really shows how interconnected all of this technology is. And of course, the backbone. And maybe I might ask you something about that later. Uh, I don't think a lot of people understand uh, how that all works, but let's save that for the, for the open forum. Uh, next up, we have, so earlier, sorry, sorry, Terry, but you know, earlier we had um, one of our partners from civil society, um, Citizen Watch, Mr. Orly Oxalis from Citizen Watch, talking about about their initiatives. Now we're going to hear from another of our partners from civil society. Uh, he's attorney Terry Ridon, former congressman Terry Ridon. Uh, he's the convener of InfraWatch Philippines, an advocacy group, an infrastructure advocacy group and think tank, and is also a non-resident fellow of Stratbase ADR Institute. So uh, Terry, good morning. The floor is yours. Hey, good morning, uh, Professor Dindo. Uh, Yusika Intik, Attorney Roy, um, uh, Vince, uh, Paco, and all the and Orly also, and Ashutosh. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, I think my remarks will be very brief, but I wanted to uh, discuss uh, first, uh, well, a particular situation that happened yesterday, which basically highlights uh, the problems with uh, the digital infrastructure that we have at the moment. Uh, the main government website was subjected to a de distributed denial of service attack by uh, what we would say a new breed of uh, activists. You know? And uh, I think they were able to uh, um, shut down the main government website, gov.ph, for I think at least uh, nine hours. No? And, uh, and I think I've been trying to check the main government website today. And as we speak, it remains unaccessible. So I think uh, in order for uh, us to really proceed, there is an importance for government, not just to assist private sector in uh, improving digital infrastructure, but also for government to basically improve its own uh, digital infrastructure. I'm not quite certain uh, which agency ought to be in charge of this and uh, whether or not the uh, interventions had already been made, because I think what is most important to understand is that an, a nine hour shutdown of the main government portal is basically unacceptable precisely because uh, the most, the, most uh, uh, the longest time that the DDoS attack that a, a major website has been subjected to has only been eight hours and it has been um, Amazon Web Services. So, it is, a, it is unacceptable for government to have a DDoS attack um, ranging beyond eight hours. You know? So I think that is something that uh, all of us as stakeholders uh, should be able to adequate, adequately respond to uh, moving forward. No? But uh, I, would, I wanted to make some important remarks as well on uh, the gains that uh, we had seen in the last few months with the order of the president um, particularly to expedite the permits uh, that we had been, uh, the difficulty of getting permits in uh, establishing towers. I think uh, we are glad that uh, we had been uh, receiving positive feedback from uh, the two telcos that uh, the order the president had in fact had some, uh, some promise, no? particularly as far as national agencies are concerned. But I think what is most important is uh, to uh, continue the, uh, the gains that we had been uh, seeing in the last uh, uh, few months. M very important here is that uh, uh, particularly the focus on local governments. You know? And uh, we had seen uh, the lament of uh, uh, telcos. And very important uh, here is that uh, for telcos to be able to engage with uh, dif different stakeholders and for them to uh, show that uh, local government ought not to be immune from the orders of the president to expedite uh, all of these things. And 
it is a national concern in the, in the same in the manner that the pandemic is a concern uh, the the concern to raise the level of connectivity to raise the level of bandwidth is a national concern as well so uh, we cannot accept uh, explanations of barangays of local government units that they are trying to impose exorbitant fees they're trying to uh, impose unreasonable permits no and unreasonable regulation that are basically not within the ambit of the order of the president. So I think uh, this is an ongoing concern that uh, the telcos should be able to resolve together with civil society and uh, with other stakeholders. I think another point that uh, needs to be made as well is that uh, we're going back to uh, the digital infrastructure in government is uh, the importance to have a fully integrated uh, digital infrastructure and IT system. I think we had seen uh, this concern in the transport uh, sector in which uh, there is no full integration as an example between uh, the driver's licenses of, um, of uh, uh, car owners or, or drivers, uh, their uh, vehicle systems, and the traffic management uh, systems that we have in our roads, you know, which is why one of uh, the reasons why we cannot have a very adequate contactless apprehension system is precisely because of that. Pagkaho na picture yung plaka, amababayaran lang hu yung plaka after how long? After like a year? After two years? Uh, masyado na hong matagal. So, uh, very important is the point that without integ without full integration of these systems, even the prospect of innovation, particularly for uh, the entry of uh, public-private partnerships into these areas, will be very difficult. Because if it is fully integrated, you have different providers for these. Uh, for example, no one would want to enter into agreements, for example, in having a more contactless oppression centers kung uh, hindi ho sila mababayaran in the soonest time kung mababayaran lang sila for a single uh, traffic violation after one to two years. So these things, ought, uh, government ought to really rethink its strategy in uh, specific areas as well. And I think as a final point, no, um, well, and this is a message really to the entire sector, uh, I think there is a, a new innovation on uh, the delivery of uh, data through uh, uh, Elon Musk's Starlink. You know? So I think we had seen uh, some industry experts really um, trying to really sell this to the public. But of course, this is still a new technology. Uh, I think uh, Starlink is still a bit very far from uh, really penetrating uh, the Philippine market. There are still uh, regulatory permits that need to be undertaken for this. And I think the costs are still very high. I think at the level of in the, in, in where they are having a limited release, I think around $600 is what is needed for them to uh, get access to the system. This is very far from uh, the mass market prices that we would like to see in order for have a, a greater penetration into the Philippine market. So I think uh, more needs to be done and uh, the relationship and the nexus between government, uh, private sector and uh, civil society needs to be further developed because there are low hanging fruits that uh, we can really uh, see uh, some progress in particularly uh, with top level instructions from the president to basically expedite uh, the level of service and, and raise the level of service uh, that we are currently having. So yun lamang po, maraming salamat, uh, mabuhay po. Hi, uh, thanks Terry. Thanks for that. Morning, oh, sorry. I... Siri, Siri started talking. Uh, so yeah, oh, thanks Terry so much. Uh, that's uh, Terry Ridon from InfraWatch sharing his insight on, on the importance of digital infrastructure uh, for a digital Philippines, you know, and moving forward as we as we fully in, need and the need to fully integrate these technologies into 
to how we operate. Okay, um, so at this point in the program, we're actually opening the, we're gonna open the, the Q&A portion, the open forum. And we're a bit, apparently we're a bit behind schedule, but I think we can still have a few interesting questions here. And I think I want to start with uh, the Q&A question that uh, I think uh, Yusek Kaintik indicated that he would answer live. So there's a question here from uh, Erwin Alampay. And it's, uh, Yusek Kaintik mentioned something about the role of LGUs given the expected increase in IRA. Do you think the LGUs can leverage this for bridging the digital divide? Are there possible PPPs that can be done at the local level? In what areas can PPPs be established with respect to addressing the gaps in digital infra? Can LGUs be providers? Yusek, um, want to answer? Thank you, Paco. Thank you, uh, Mr. Alampay, for the question. That's precisely the focus of the uh, provincial broadband networks that we are trying to firm up with our MOUs. We're coming up with a framework wherein we will allow the LGUs to, on their end, create a PPP uh, arrangement. Our, our, our objective from the DICT side would be to become, uh, for them to become our service provider in ext by extension. So the PBBs, the, or what we call the provincial broadbands, will actually be uh, sourcing their internet from the national fiber backbone, which we are building. So our efforts will be concentrated in creating the national highway, and then the, the branches will be helped by the uh, provincial networks. Uh, I, we encourage them to have their own PPPs. Uh, I think that's what the um, Baguio City Pataan province is already trying to do. So we're helping them on that. And we are also, uh, we already are also helping uh, Negros. So to answer your question, that's precisely why we wanted this because with the Mandana's resolution, there has to be increased their IRA so they can actually help invest into that PPP initiative. Thank you. Thanks, Yusuf. Um, in connection with that, you mentioned in your answer for that. So this is the LGUs. The question of Alam, uh, Mr. Alampai was about the LGUs, and you mentioned the national something about the national government uh, providing the backbone uh, in so many words. And and we, I thought it was connected to another question that we got uh, here. That uh, sorry, sorry. Um, here we go. For you, and Dick, how much is needed to light up the broadband backbone? And how long will it take to link up this network to the last mile consumers? So I think it's a connected question. Okay, uh, good question. No? Uh, the initial approach was to light up the NGCP fiber that we have. But now we are exploring an alternative approach of simply leasing a network of rings from, other, uh, from the existing fiber backbones that are being laid out by the likes of the existing telcos. So it's an open, we're gonna open that bid, no? Uh, the things that we, the, what we're toying around is uh, region-wide. So we're gonna bid out region one, region two, region three, and then we will just network them. So those regional rings or regional, or, or supra-regional rings, like the whole Bicol region with all its sub-regions, there will be a series of rings. So we will just connect them. How about the NGCP that we have been talking about? That's just gonna. That's now our uh, resiliency point. That line of that uh, of that uh, NGCP. So we are now seriously considering uh, leasing long-term lease uh, rings of fibers, uh, backbone fibers from existing telcos uh, in the next few years. So on April, actually we will create a uh, digital infrastructure uh, plan planning. Uh, we will invite uh, Better Broadband Alliance and it will be, we're in talks with USAID uh, Respond and USAID Deliver to facilitate that discussion. So we will hold ourselves up in a place and um, really come up with an almanac of the digital infrastructure plan. 
because the national broadband plan was if you read it it's a plan to make a plan so now <laughs> if you read it carefully half of the document says it was half about what's the the, the hung, you know it, the intro is so long half of it was what was wrong in 2015 14 at that state then the rest of the pages were a plan to make a plan mm -hmm. so on april i will hold up the entire Infrastructure Management Bureau, mm -hmm. the Government Digital Transformation Bureau, facilitated by USAID Respond, USAID Deliver. Uh, and then we will invite sectors, uh, the telcos, uh, in, in several, several of sessions, so that we will determine, oh, how many fiber, how much fiber do you have in this area? How much do you have, do you have? So we will survey. And then it will come up, we, we want to intend, we intend to create an almanac of sort of the plans per region, per province, all the way to the last mile, including um, the free Wi-Fi spots because in the free Wi-Fi spots, we are able to finance kasi the endpoint, at least for the Wi-Fi on those sites. So that will help ano, uh, facilitate. Uh, mm -hmm. Lastly, uh, we will put also specific places wherein we will light up the national government data centers, plural. So what that will provide a decreased latency, so at least backups also of the servers, so that incidents like this, uh, this uh, gov.ph will no longer be uh, will no long will be a thing of the past. Right now, I said it's not fully resilient. Uh, sad, sad to say that. So we have to invest in that infrastructure yet. Um, but we're working on the issue, pala. Um, I, I still, I'm still looking. I'm still asking for the latest update. Um, so yon, you know, the, the 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 comprehensive plan from the landing stations that we own, even landing stations that the telcos own. So we will intend to buy also from buy buy uh, and with from the telcos from the other endpoints because. Uh, for example, in Mindanao, there are landing stations already in Mindanao. We might as well light that up already. So the strategy would be not to you know, do a linear approach, but to have several rings light up and then link them up together. I hope Excellent. I was able to answer it. Yeah, yeah, you were. Thank you, Yusek. Uh, yeah. And actually, in relation to that, you mentioned uh, Bona, uh, a lot of First of all, a lot of collaboration happening between the public and private sector. So we, we welcome that. Uh, also, civil society, you mentioned, I think, that you were going to come up with this, this almanac, right, of plans. And I'm sure groups like Citizen Watch will be, will be part of that discussion. Uh, but at the same time, when you mention uh, perhaps, you know, leasing bandwidth from telcos, what this what this uh, makes me think, man, is also that the telcos themselves, mean they have to continue building the infrastructure that they have actually something to lease, something to use, right? And and so that leads me to this this question here that uh, uh, for for the telcos at the present pace of your network expansion, how long will it take to catch up with the cell tower backlog? Is that something that you could shed some light on? Vince and attorney. Um, can you if you, you would like to, but uh, also for Vince and attorney Ibai, if they would like to. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a very nice question. Actually, uh, apples to apples, I think uh, it would be a bit easier to to uh, respond to that if um, uh, in comparison or if you benchmark these countries where you have high higher uh, telecom tower. Uh, Rollout is that government also uh, did its part. No? I think that's 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 been out already since last year in so many Senate, uh, Congress hearings and all that. And I think also Professor Manhit adequately mentioned it in his column uh, yesterday. I think where he said that you know even the ICT was requesting for an 18 billion budget, and well, it, uh, the only budget that was given to them is 1.8 billion. So that's uh, that's a whole lot of um, you know, big, uh, huge cut no, in terms of their request. So, so what I'm saying is, I think the government or DICT is doing uh, uh, their 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 part, uh, despite the fact that they have a limited budget. They initially have initiated this. 
uh, they they acknowledge the fact that um, telecom uh, infrastructure growth now in the country is largely private sector led. We have a new uh, player already uh, also that launched this week. And so as they say, um, a rising tide raises all ships. This will be good for the economy. This will be good for the country. And um, well, uh, for the for, on the side of telcos, all we ask really is for everybody, you know, especially when you say government, it goes to different agencies and also the local governments to, well, all hands on deck. No? Tulong, tulong sana. Everybody will will do their part, no, to be able to for us um, uh, telcos to be able to roll out, no, not only in terms of powers, but also in terms of fiber, which I think also has heightened already the importance uh, because of the pandemic that a good reliable fiber backbone is uh, crucial, no, to be able to deliver good uh, telecommunication services. Thanks, thanks, Ray. Vince? Uh, yes, um, as mentioned uh, earlier, um, the telcos have already been spending close to half of its uh, revenues. No? Our, our CapEx to revenue ratio is in the 45 to 50% already. And there's very little room for us to increase our investments. And as mentioned by Tony Ebay earlier, that uh, we will need the help of the government to fast track even further our build requirements. No? Um, they've also the government has also helped us uh, through easing the permits and also um, starting uh, and bringing in these tower codes um, to the country and uh, I think these tower codes can continue to help us uh, uh, ease the capex pressures, if you will, um, and allow us to build more more sites, no, uh, with uh, more players investing in towers or passive equipment. So that uh, the telcos can uh, um, invest in more active equipment, no. So we'd rather invest in active equipment than on passive equipment. And uh, we continue to ask also the private sector, no, to uh, because I guess we, we need their help as well to be able to roll out our facilities to places that uh, cannot be reached at this point. Would you believe that there are certain areas in Metro Manila that we cannot reach because of opposition from the neighborhood or the villages, right? So these continue to be um, uh, blind spot, uh, sorry, uh, 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 hot spots for us, no? As far as uh, coverage and capacity is concerned. So it's really a, a uh, partnership across uh, the telcos, the private sector, um, the government and civil society, you know, to, to bridge uh, us to where we want to be as far as digital transformation is concerned. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. Uh, ne next up, I actually wanted to go back to a question earlier. Ashu was uh, raised earlier a question about, you know, connecting the, the many islands, and you're talking about the backbone, and, and now we're talking about, uh, you know, all of these cell towers. And I, I think we're almost getting ahead of ourselves because I don't. I think a lot of people don't understand. Um, like what the role of the, the backbone or even submarine cables are in, in this whole industry. We're so used to having, you know, mobile data, Wi-Fi, that we think internet is wireless, but in fact, it's, uh, it's not quite the case. Maybe, I, Ashu, do you think you, you could explain a bit to, to our participants what, yeah, thank you, how it all works? I can try. Um, I can try. Um, basically, submarine cables are uh, the big pipes that carry your... Uh, day-to-day uh, -day traffic and transport it from one point to the other point. Now, um, as you can uh, imagine, um, there is a um, localized traffic, let's say last mile traffic, it has to go to the base station. Several base stations are connected uh, to a main network, a main switch, and this these regional, then you have a localized switch, and then you have regional switch, and every, everything is connected. So, all this big traffic that is consolidated has to travel. And these travel uh, goes through the arteries, the big arteries. And these arteries of telecommunication is a backbone. And these backbones provide the primary uh, pipes that carry this traffic. And these pipes are the basic, they have to be solid. 
And uh, like Mr. Roy also said, you need a very high quality, reliable backbone to carry the basic uh, traffic of day-to-day -day traffic, right? So all these telcos, the first step they do when they, in a, they uh, resurrect their infrastructure is to create the first backbone. And over the backbone, they created, they create the access networks. Now these access networks uh, take the local traffic and then they collect these uh, big, the traffic to and transport it to the regional hubs. Now, when, when, when you have islands, uh, 7,000 islands, uh, these islands need to be connected to the main switch. And the, so you have the traffic of those islands and these islands have to communicate with the hubs like internet ISPs and then data centers. And these, this traffic of one island has to be transported to the big islands and to the main switch, uh, to the national network, and they have to be meshed together. This complete traffic in, at the background is uh, going through submarine cables. Now, uh, most of the people around the world think uh, the uh, internet traffic goes via satellite between uh, uh, countries and uh, Europe and uh, US. All these internet traffic travels to submarine cables. These are the cables that goes into this in the sea. They are buried in the seabed up to the uh, up to the depth of eight thousand meters. And these uh, there's a complete web of these cables in the sea. And these are the cables that carry the basic telecommunication traffic. Now imagine you have uh, uh, access network, very good 5G and uh, mobile network, but if they if the backbone is crippled or the bad quality and or it's not working, there is no communication between that island and the rest of the world. That is why it's very, very important to have backbone, a solid backbone. Uh, just last one line coming back from WINS, uh, most of the private players, they do not have economical, it's not feasible, economically feasible for them to connect remote islands where the it's not the popul they're not highly populated. So most of the world governments and also Philippines government is taking the initiative initiative to create a ICT fund and the government fund they basically what they do is they uh, issue a tender and they finance up to 70 percent of this network backbone creation and they, these uh, tenders uh, are issued to the private companies who who are basically financed by the government for 70% of the initial capex. And then there is a PPP model that um, government and the private companies, they work together to create the connectivity uh, to these 7,000 islands. So if you are not using, if you're just using 10 to 15% of your natural assets and resources by not using 80% of your uh, uninhabited inhabited islands, basically you are wasting your resources. So by just uh, implementing the initial capex and this contribution has to come from the government, I think there's a there will be an exponential growth both socially and economically for the whole country. Thanks. Thanks, Ashu. That, that does give us, I think, a, a lot more understanding of how, how undersea cables and, and all of how the internet itself works, especially in, in, a, in an archipelago like the Philippines. And I think really that it becomes so much more important also given that we're in a, an archipelago uh, to connect all the different, you know, the people that live in the different parts of the country, like you said, for economic and social reasons. Uh, we have one question here actually from Mr. Dewey Montemar of uh, advocacy group called Bantai BK3, Bantai Consumer. Uh, and his question is related to, to schools, benefit of schools and communities. Uh, and this is for Yusek Kaintik. Yusek Kaintik, we have a question here po from Dewey Montemar. Can the DICT consider a special focus on how our schools and community health institutions can benefit most from your work at the DICT. Our consumers, after all, uh, our consumers, after all of digital services are uh, concentrated most in these institutions, in health and, and educational institutions. 
can our DICT speakers share a bit more on what effort efforts there are in this regard? You say, can you take First of all, uh, we respect the purview of CHED and DepEd on the schools. In fact, in the Bayanihan 2 bill, they were given specifically 3 billion pesos to use in the instant upgrade of their infrastructure system. So it was very clear. It was not coursed through the ICT. In the bill, it was coursed, it was directed to DepEd and Ted. So they were given both 3 billion each, I think. Three or four. One was three, one was four. So what they needed from the ICT was, and then, then they turned around and said, uh, for, for CHED, uh, the, the CHED leadership asked the ICT for guidance on how to help maximize the use of these funds, of these funds to the SUCs, of which we help create a framework. Well, you start with a, a quick test of your speeds, a quick test of your network layout, how many of your buildings and everything like that that happened in a month or two last year. Uh, in constant coordination with the Commission and Bank, with all the regional heads of the IC, of the DEP, of the CHED. On that ed, uh, the, uh, I think the leadership of Director Bramby took it took on the, the challenge by himself, uh, all through himself, uh, by by themselves, and it's it was good. Uh, Bramby is a a, a classmate, uh, a doormate of mine, a schoolmate of mine, so very good. So they did not need that uh, uh, plan anymore because they already had the working plan of how they're going to use that money. Uh, so from a from a resource standpoint, uh, it was said we guided more for the 100 SUCs. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we could use those for the other high, higher education institutions, the other AGIs. That the most that the ICT can provide, however, is from our limited funds is to make sure that we are able to connect them through our GovNet or provide them the internet bandwidth that we are already aggregating. Absent the national broadband, we actually have an existing GovNet framework. So we extend specific fiber, lay, uh, uh, fiber build outs all the way to an endpoint SUC. It's actually quite costly. Huh? For some SUCs, actually, it's better to just get it from a local pub like PLDT or Globe, where's the nearest, and then we buy it and we pay it for them. But that with the 3 billion pesos that Shed has, they could actually pay for that as well. So all we did was help them on that aspect. We also helped the Shed on creating a uniform uh, ecosystem. I think they selected two or three uh, learning management systems platform for, the, for some of their SUCs to use. So some of their SUCs are already clients of PLDT. They're using their PLDT uh, MS Teams uh, solution and LMS. Some are even using Globes. I mean, clients, nila, they're all existing clients. But there are other SUCs, the not so rich ones, no? Sorry for the word, but the not so rich, not so uh, the economically challenged SUCs. It was the DICTs. LMS that is being used by its ICT Academy that we retrofitted for the use of the CHED for the other SUCs. For the Depth Ed, uh, we have been collaborating naman, but we simply approve their IS plan because I think the Depth Ed has a more, comp uh, they already have their plan even before the pandemic. I think uh, the, they have an entire program which we supported. Uh, as for devices, we have a small program for devices, but it's not enough because as Attorney Roy Ibai said, we barely have enough budget anyway. But what we can do is to create the standards and help firm up the standards on that. But we cannot be giving out tablets and laptops because it, it's actually costly and we don't have the budget for it. Thank you, over. And then for the medical institutions, as I said in my presentation earlier, the focus was providing, first and foremost, the internet connectivity in those RHUs because sempre, di ba, you're quarantined and some people get lonely, they needed the internet. So we made sure the quarantine facilities, the isolation facilities had internet. And then now we're going to focus on providing Wi-Fi and connectivity on the vaccination centers so that they can religiously and promptly send the 
vaccinated list as well as the master list uh, accurate uh, as open as as possible thank you over thanks you say uh i'll just jump over to our next question which i think uh Again, for you, Seca, I think, and but also our telcos and our other speakers from civil society, please chime in as well. Um, it was raised at several earlier, po, several issues delaying uh, the tower builds mentioned involved the LGUs, you said. How can this be remedied? How can the directive to cut permitting timelines be enforced? And are there penalties for LGUs violating this policy? Okay, thank you very much, Paco. Yes, sir. If you know, if you guys all know, there is RA 11032 or the Ease of Doing Business Act. In very general terms, it's very clear. Actually, it's not very, gen it's not very general. It's very specific terms. There's a 3721 volatilia there. But the problem is in the details. That's why we had to make joint memorandum circulars because the deep, the problem involves when it involves interagency. When a permit, a permit cycle actually involves interagency, right? If you do not press out the details and really ask, oh, so why is it 20? Why can't it be done by two days? You have to really do that. And that's what we had to exercise. I need you guys to understand, huh? There's an entire effort prior to just signing the JMC, what we had called a regulatory impact assessment. i sorry, I, I, I used to be the ARTA consultant just prior to joining the ICT. So the whole regulatory reform was my project prior to joining the ICT. So very close to my heart. In fact, my observation, I guess you don't, we have the central business portal, business WhatsApp shop. If I could just turn back time a bit, I might as well have concentrated on the after. The after, the, when the problems of existing businesses, because registering a new business, that happens once and right? It, it's also, very, there's so much talk about that. But for, for in the telco world, the, 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 the project, the, the, the crux is not on, getting in. It's about the day-to-day the -day in each and every tower, in each and every fiber you want to build. So we have to thresh out. Again, if I could only just turn back a time a little bit, but it's again, we just move forward. The next focus is on fiber build out. We have hurdled the hours. People are scared. And I'm sad that Troy said, yeah, but sometimes they still take 60 days. Okay. That's really bad. If you want to say no, say no to me fast, right? You're going to be busted. You're, you're courting someone. If she says no, tell me soon, right? So that I can, I can move on. But the problem is they say no so long. So our threshing out the steps, the reasoning, the argumentations, the criteria of deciding, we have to go to that level, sadly. And you have to go through that level because leave them on their own, the LGUs, that they will not try to streamline the process. So we had to go through streamlining the process and then come up with the JMC. So that's how that's the effort that the DICP has to do because we are the lead on this area. ARPA has a lot of areas, huh? they have logistics, pa, marami pang other industries. But it is the DICT's job to spearhead. And then ARTA, maganda kay ARTA because it's like a bulldog, eh? right? Bulldog, oh, we, we, we have to go through the, press the details of boss. If they do not follow, you sue them, huh? something like that. So that's how the relationship goes. But that we have to go through the details or else they will find and skirt issues. Tama, right? Attorney Roy? And then they are now, they're starting to creep up again. You know, Filipinos are very creative in answering no long, eh? Diba? So we, it, is, it is the DICT's job to help the telcos in this problem. And this should have been done a long time ago. But anyway, we're here and we're doing it. Thank you. Over. Thank you, Yusek. Thank you for all the initiatives of the DICT to 
to help us move forward towards digital transformation. Are, are do any of our speakers from our telcos want to to add to what you said? Has, has said. Yeah, very briefly lang. Uh, again, no, uh, Yusek, thank you. Thank you for your words of support. And uh, we hope that, uh, well, despite that uh, it will be election year next year, and uh, I don't know if you noticed, a lot of things are kind of ra rather moving slower and slower now because <laughs> a lot of people are now shifting their machineries, their efforts into building machineries for the election next year. I hope this uh, won't be the case for the entire year. You know? So again, thank you. Thank you, sir, for all your support. Thanks, Attorney Roy. Yeah. Vince? So, yeah. Uh, as, as mentioned earlier, we have gotten a lot of support from the government. Obviously, no implementation is perfect, and we continue to work with the ICT, ARTA, and the ILG to thresh out all of these challenges. Um, uh, DILG and ARTA have given us uh, some means or venue to report uh, people who have not, or LGUs who have not been complying to the ease of doing business law, the JMC and Bayanihan 2 law. So we continuously meet with them on a regular basis. Um, as, but as mentioned by Yusek Kaintik, uh, there's still a lot of things that need to be threshed out, like the fiber permits. Okay, hopefully we can get that done. Uh, one thing that we've been requesting also um, from ARTA, the ICT, and then DILG is maybe a more um, explicit or a white list of permits uh, that uh, the LG should ask from us because uh, we continue to face issues uh, as far as the interpretation of the JMC, uh, the Bayanian 2 law, and uh, you know each, each LG has its own uh, interpretation, thus causing some confusion on our part. Uh, so would appreciate if you could get uh, some more clarity on a more explicit uh, set of permits being asked from the telcos for both telco towers and fiber permits. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Vince, like Attorney Roy and Yusek. Uh, Yusek, go ahead, Bob. There are two objectives of the dashboard that we are building. I forgot to say it. Transparency a visibility, and predictability. I think that's what the two just or, and all the telcos need. Transparency. You guys are all looking at the same chart. If you're saying, I submitted this today, the LG you also sees it that, ah, okay, it's there. Arta will see it's the same day. So count seven from there. Count 21 from there. Seven. 21 is too long, but still, I think Roy is already okay with 21, no? <laughs> but but as, as long as you know, it's gonna happen on the 21st day, not early or earlier. So visibility, everybody sees the same thing, that permit, and predictability. Because as businessmen, you're willing to take on the cost, right? But what is really costing you more is the unpredictability of the duration, right, of the permit. You cannot start building unless you have the permit, but you do not know when that is coming out, right? So that's what the dashboard, in accordance to the JMC, needs to happen. And I think it's even far more important than I'm also doing the central business portal and both. I'm not saying these are not important. Those are my pet projects, but I think this is important for connectivity, no? That, that, the, the transparency that you, the LGUs, the DILG, and the PWH need to see for. Thank, Thank you, Sek. Thank you, Sek. Thank you, Sek. Actually, you, you raised the point I was going to bring up po, about the need for transparency and uh, you know, dependability, I think was the word that you used. Um, and I think at this point, it reminds me of, you know, we have some representatives here from civil society Citizen Watch and Infra Watch, and uh, I know that there there are some initiatives from your side, uh, Arlie and Terry, uh, with regards to bringing some transparency to the process. Would you like to give some, you know, reactions on that? Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks, Paco. We've been actually monitoring these issues for quite some time. Uh, I, for one. Um, uh, having watched uh, 
the development of our telecommunications industry since it uh, first started, when, since the first days of uh, our cell phones. And uh, I've been hearing all of these um, uh, issues again and again for decades. And I'm really glad that uh, uh, we're moving forward with all of these reforms in terms of policy. But again, I, I do agree that uh, it's real, the devil is really in the details and really down there in front. I, I, I really cannot forget uh, my conversations with, the, with the, one of the uh, 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 builders of these towers who are contracted by these major telcos. And uh, the litany of, uh, uh, of, of uh, roadblocks that he had, to, um, he had to go through just to put up one tower. Um, this is really what uh, Telecom Tower Watch wants to address and uh, uh, really making all of these processes transparent uh, to the public is uh, in itself becomes a deterrent. Uh, we've done this before in some advocacies in the power sector, and uh, we got a very positive reaction from those stakeholders who were affected. And it's the same thing that we want to do here. Uh, the, the stakeholders in, in the digital infrastructure is, is really uh, from left to right of the spectrum. And uh, if there are really some uh, parties that are causing un, undue delay, uh, we, we need to get that out. And uh, uh, getting that out and out in the public is uh, in itself is already a, a big deterrent because uh, people get to know or the public gets to know, the government and the regulators, that uh, there's a problem in this area that, uh, uh, that's totally unreasonable. Therefore, there should be action on it. We're, we're, uh, we're, we're really happy that we're going to work with uh, the DICT and, and the telcos and all the stakeholders on this. And uh, uh, we're actually going to plan our first session sometime after Holy Week. Thank you. Yeah, um, Paco, sorry, I'm in transit, no? so I, I turned off my no worries. video. No worries. Um, I think like uh, what uh, we had previ previously stated, uh, it seems pretty clear at this point, uh, which has been the cause of much of the delay, particularly in building up the infrastructure in different parts of the country. So I think what's most important is for uh, national government, civil society, and the private sector to work together, no? to basically resolve this problem. And if it means that uh, we will have to engage different forms of initiatives no, to really make sure that uh, the president's directives on uh, expediting and raising the level of service is uh, undertake, undertaken in the soonest time, I think all of us should uh, definitely uh, work together. No? So, ibig sabihin, hindi talaga ubra na yung pong mga kapitan sa mga kagawad will basically just uh, give us a blank wall and wala na ho tayong magagawa. That is not how government works. And uh, in order for us to basically make sure that our kids are able to experience online learning uh, going through this pandemic, talagang hindi ho ubra na nagpapalusot ho si Konsihal, nagpapalusot ho yung mga kagawad para lang hindi ho tayo makapagtayo ng mga towers po natin. So, inamang maraming salamat. Thanks, Terry. Uh, we're actually, you know, approaching the end of, of our period designated for questions. But, you know, I, I still want to give the opportunity to any of our speakers. If they wanted to have, a, you know, some last words that they wanted to share with, our, with the participants this, uh, this morning. If none, that's also okay. Since I think we are, are uh... I just have one uh, uh, last comment. I just want to reiterate uh, because Philippines is a developing country. Uh, every cent, every dollar is precious, uh, and uh, we have seen uh, from many countries that um, the government issues have a lot of initiatives. They spend a lot of money. They allocate a lot of funds. But due to certain um, um, procedures or 
unavailability of certain criteria on qualities and other things, they end up paying three times for the same infrastructure because the basic conditions on the qualities are not set. And the focus is on to have the lowest tender or the lowest quality or the lowest price wins uh, to say 5%, 6% on the CapEx, but end up paying 150% times more. So this is, these are the things coupled with the national security issues, uh, speci specifically when you are designing and laying the foundations of your backbone what kind of products you need from where you want to buy them, uh, where the fibers are coming from. Uh, this is such a sensitive issue and there's a global debate going on. So my request is that if certain emphasis can be given on the international standards, uh, the, the products that you will be using in your backbone has to be very high, good quality, high quality. High quality doesn't mean you pay for diamond. It has to have a cost-effective value, value for money and also keeping in mind the national securities and other cyber securities in mind. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Ashu. Yeah, so um, with that, you know, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. To officially close, I'll officially close the Q&A and thank all of our speakers for, for entertaining and answering all the questions from our participants. Uh, I'd like to also give a, a brief closing remarks just to formally close our event today. Uh, you know, we had a very interesting discussion this morning. Uh, we really talked a lot about the importance of telecommunications infrastructure in you know, moving towards a digital Philippines. That's what we're, uh, we're calling it. And you know, Mr. Manhit, in his opening remarks, highlighted you know, the increased use in the daily lives of technology for Filipinos, the, the economic impact as well of, of uh, technology and connective technology in the country's development. You know, Vince uh, Tempoco talked about the exponential acceleration of use. And you know, Attorney Roy Ebay also mentions, you know, the social impact as well of, of all of these technologies. Uh, and given this importance is uh, slowly and uh, quickly rising importance of technology. Uh, I take note of what uh, Yusek Aintik said about the need for a tele telecommunications ecosystem in the country, uh, the call from our industry partners for, you know, more cell sites and streamlined permitting processes, as well as what Terry did on of uh, InfraWatch called fully integrated technology, as well as transparency in line with uh, telecommunications watch. Telecom Watch, Telecom Tower Watch, or Citizen Citizen Watch. Uh, but given all of these uh, these needs, we also have challenges: the LGUs, the the need for streamlining processes, and of course the the geographic challenges presented by our our archipelago, as Ashu pointed out. Uh, and with that, you know, Stratbase ATRI really thinks that the solution to this is uh, to work together. If that means in the process of, uh, of pushing for more budget allocation for the DICT, for the National Broadband Plan in the 2022 national budget, uh, to more collaboration across sectors and across levels of government, national and local, to streamline the process to deliver quality and reliable services to Filipinos. At the same time, we also hope for the success of what we consider low-hanging fruits that can be done, that can be accomplished uh, right now through initiatives such as Telecom Tower Watch, of Citizen Watch, and the DICT. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you all for joining us this morning. And uh, I look forward to, to more collaboration and to better technology for a, for a digital Philippines moving forward. Thank you very much, everybody, and have uh, a good uh, good day. Salamat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.